we started just a really short mini-series with you last week, talking a little bit about wondering where God is when we hurt. And, um, you know, it's obvious if you look at the culture that we live in today, if you spend any time listening to the news or reading the news, you can understand quickly that we live in a culture, not just in the United States, but in the world, that is a hurting, hurting population. And in the world that we live in, uh, people try to use any kind of cocktail to numb the pain, from alcohol to opioids to marijuana to medical marijuana to cocaine to methamphetamines, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And when I see all of it, it grieves my heart because to me, it's indicative that we live in a world that's full of hurting people. And we will do whatever we possibly can to numb the pain, to relieve the pain, to ignore the pain, to get away from the pain. And so in those moments of pain, uh, maybe you have been in a painful situation and you wonder, where, where is God when it hurts? And last week we just talked about that when we start to make God the focus of our life instead of the pain, when God becomes the focus of our life instead of the pain, we can walk into church on a Sunday morning and feel absolutely empty and void and walk away completely full and satisfied because we found the God that wants to meet the needs when things in life just hurt. And some people get in places of desperation in their life, and maybe you've never prayed these exact same words, but Jesus prayed these words. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I think Jesus is quoting directly from Psalm 22. And if Jesus prayed words like that, what's to say you and I wouldn't pray words like that as well? And maybe you feel a little bit like that. Maybe you're watching us online and you can relate to this. And that's exactly, you, do. you just maybe have never verbalized those words. But in your mind, you're just wondering, where are you, God? It feels like you are so far away. And what makes it feel even more painful sometimes is the random pain in our life. There's random pain that comes to us. We are trying to live right. We're trying to worship right. We're trying to be right. We're trying to do right. And in the midst of trying to be right and do right, something just rocks our world and shakes our lives. And it's the random pain. I mean, think about it, though. What if, uh, what if random pain wasn't just random? What if the random pain that we struggle with and feel in our life what if it had a reason? What if there was a purpose to it? We don't usually think about that in the moment of pain. What we think about in the moment of pain when life hurts and something is going on is, why? And have you ever asked this question before? I have. Why is this happening to me? As if I should be excluded from the pain. I should be separated from the pain. As if I should be exempt from the pain. I mean, I look at the lives of other people and I can see why they suffer pain. But me, it should be all different with me. Why is this happening to me? Because I think if we knew the reason why, we want a context for pain. If pain has a context, we will endure it. And, and, and all of us in this room, we've, we have not just had random pain in our life. We have selected pain in our life. Come on. How many people have ever started a diet in your life? And you know why you're not on the diet anymore? Pain. That's why. Anybody started an exercise program? How many left the exercise program? You know why you left it? Pain, right? But there's other times we go through pain, like a piercing. If you've had a piercing, this is what's funny to me. Ew, I can't do needles. Like, I just can't, know to get a vaccine, no, I can't do needles. And they get piercings hanging all over their face, right? Or they have a tattoo. They will elect the pain if they know there's a reason for the pain. They'll do it. But what about that random pain? And all of us have stories about pain. And the stories are different. But the pain is the same. It's the pain you feel when there's betrayal. It's the pain that you feel when there's been a broken relationship. It's the pain that you feel when there's been a divorce, when there's been death, when somebody has cut you with words, when somebody has pierced you with truth. And sometimes, sometimes we choose our pain, and sometimes pain chooses us. Sometimes, let's just be honest, we choose our trials, and sometimes our trials 
choose us. Today, I wonder if you ever feel like the troubles of life have just clamped you in and gripped you, and you just wonder why. What's the purpose in all of this? I mean, I thought things were going so well. And this is what I love about God's Word. God's Word has um, stories in there that I think, I think there's a reason the story is in there. And the story is in there not just to entertain us, it's to encourage us. And there's a story about two guys that were key figures starting the church, and really you and I are here today as a result of what these guys did so long ago. Their names are Paul and Silas. And I'm going to be reading to you from the book of Acts this morning. Acts, you'll find it in the New Testament part of your Bible. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 16 today. Let me give you a little backstory to bring you up to where we're going to go today in the story. Paul and Silas have been traveling around and they're preaching the word of God wherever they go because that's what they did. And they started churches and planted churches. And they would just walk amongst the public people and be proclaiming the word of God and find a place to stop and preach and tell people about Jesus. And that's what they did. And uh, for a while, at this particular point in Paul and Silas's life, there was a little girl that followed them around. We would uh, speculate she was maybe late adolescent, early teens. She was a slave. She was owned by a couple of people. She would tell people's fortunes, if that were possible. We find out that, in fact, she was possessed by a demonic spirit. And she's following Paul and Silas around. And and for days this goes on. She's saying, these men are going to tell you how to find salvation in the name of Jesus. These men are going to tell you how to find salvation in the name of Jesus. This goes on for days. And finally, in exasperation, Paul turns around, he looks at this girl, and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you evil spirits come out of her. I wondered why did he let this go on for days? Maybe it was just grace that Paul felt. I don't know what it was in him, but I know this, that Paul did not want Jesus declared out of the mouth of a girl demon-possessed. So he casts the evil spirit out of the girl. Well, now, The people that owned this girl as a slave who made a lot of money by her because of her fortune telling now realize she's worthless to them to make any kind of a money. Now they're upset with Paul. Before Paul, they could say whatever he wanted to. didn't bother him at all, but now they're angry with Paul. In Acts chapter 16, beginning in verse number 22, look what happens. These uh, these slave owners, uh, they kind of get everybody on their side, and it says, a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. Isn't it true? No good deed goes unpunished. Doesn't it seem that way sometimes? I mean, Paul and Silas just did this amazing thing for this little girl, and the reward that they get is that a mob forms, they're beaten with wooden rods. Verse number 23, they were severely beaten, and then they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was ordered to make sure that they didn't escape. Let me ask you this, just a side note as you read that. How much has your Christianity cost you this last week? And Paul and Silas, this is what they endured. And this Roman soldier was not supposed to be bribed or bought off. The jailers at the time, I suppose somebody could come and bribe them and maybe somebody could just kind of mysteriously disappear out of jail. But this time, his authority said, you put this man in the inner cell and you make sure that these guys don't get out because it's going to be your life for theirs if they do. And so he took this seriously. Verse 24, and so the jailer put them into the the inner dungeon, the place where it would feel like the least amount of hope, the place where it would be the darkest, the dampest, the coldest, and the smelliest. And he clamped their feet in the stocks. They're chained to walls now. Maybe... uh, as I picture it, those iron shanks anchored into the stone walls. If you could feel the stones, they're wet with human perspiration, damp from the secretion of moisture in the earth. And their feet are locked into place. We don't know if they were in a squatting position. We're in a standing position, but we knew that they were 
apparently without hope of freedom. Like I said, sometimes you choose your trials. If we're just really honest, sometimes we behave our way into difficult situations, be it debt or relationships or health or whatever it is. Sometimes, come on, we, we choose our trials. If we're really honest, we have nobody to blame for the problems in our life but ourselves. And then there's other times when, when life is just going on so well and, 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 and we thought we were doing so well. And suddenly, suddenly, something happens so unexpected it was the last thing we wanted to happen. And you feel stuck in the inner, inner dungeon. You know, divorce can do that to a person's mind. Addictions can do that to a person's mind. A breakup can do that when you gave your whole heart to someone. Guilt, regret, remorse, shame. And we can come to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, feeling any one of those emotions, going through any of those things. And if it's not for ourselves, it's for somebody that we love. We sense their incarceration in the inner dungeon. And pain, understand, can create victims of any of us in this room, but none of us has to remain in a state of victimhood. You can be free. And that's the great thing about the power and the name and the hope that is possessed in Jesus Christ. The one to be pitied most is the one who wants to live in self-pity. Let's not live in the self-pity. What are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do when you feel like God has absolutely abandoned you? When your goodness and the good deeds and your trying so hard in life is rewarded with pain. And you don't know what to do. I, uh, <clears throat> I had a freshman English teacher, and uh, she had these uh, little cutout letters up on the bulletin board. The bulletin board was just plain. I don't remember any kind of paper being up there. Maybe there was paper. I just remember the little cutout letters that she put up there. And every once in a while, and I, stayed, I think I stayed up there the whole year in English class, freshman English class. And uh, once in a while, she would have us recite it with her. And she spoke in such clearly enunciated English. In fact, if you wanted your test grade, she said, would you like to know your score? You never said, yeah, because that was an unacceptable answer. You said, yes. And on that bulletin board in the back, it said, it is your attitude. And she would say it this way, come on. Your attitude, not your aptitude, that determines your altitude. And every time she said that, I just like, Ew, just be quiet, like, I didn't know what it meant. And when you get older, you get wiser, and now I know exactly what it means. Your attitude, not your ability, not your giftings, determines where you go in life. And I love the attitude of Paul and Silas, unjustly accused, unjustly beaten with rods, unjustly put into the inner dungeon, unjustly clamped in those clamps, and they're in prison. You've read this story before. And if you haven't, look what they did. I love this. Verse 25. Around midnight, Paul and Silas, <laughs> they were praying and singing hymns to God. Isn't that awesome? While they're locked in the inner dungeon, unjustly accused, they start to pray and sing hymns to God. And I want to tell you, this is exactly where you and I need to be. The question that we have to answer in moments when, when the pain feels so random, when the pain feels so overwhelming, we've got to pause in those moments and say, is God still good? Is God only good when things are good? Or is God good all the time? Is God still present when we are in the dungeons? Is God still there when it seems like he's unaware? Is God still good? And the world is asking the same question. They're watching you when you go through the trials and the difficulties. Is God still good? What do you say? They're watching. They're watching. <laughs> I want you to understand that you can never gauge God's opinion of you based upon your present circumstances, good or bad. 
Because you know how it is. Come on, come on. You're driving. You're going to one of the big marts in town. You're going to the mall, and you've prayed this prayer. You didn't pray it out loud because you don't want the family to hear, but in your mind, you're thinking, oh, God, please give me a parking spot by the front door. <gasps> there it is. There's a shaft of light shining right on it. Nobody else can see it. You see it. And you pull right in there, and in your mind, you're going, God, you just love me so much. He didn't love you any more then than he did yesterday. In fact, you might be living in a heap of rebellion in your life. Let's just be honest. There just happened to be an empty parking spot there. Or, 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 or you might be unjustly accused and beaten with wooden rods and clamped in stocks in the inner dungeon. And that doesn't mean God doesn't love you either. You can never gauge God's opinion of you based upon your current circumstances, good or bad. And when you feel like God isn't near, understand this, you can bring him near when you sing and pray. When you feel like God isn't near, you can bring him near. You can bring him near when you start to sing and you start to pray. The, what, just to answer this question for me, what amount of complaining ever made you feel better about life? What amount of complaining ever made you feel better about yourself after the divorce? What amount of complaining ever made you feel better about yourself because of your home situation? What amount of complaining ever got you more money when you feel like you don't have enough? Complaining will never get us to where we need to be. So they're in that prison cell. They started to sing and they started to pray. Have you ever wondered, I've wondered as I read this, what were they singing? What were they singing? I can just about guarantee it's not what you're listening to on the radio. I looked up some songs the other day. Oh, my, did I blush. Top 10 pop songs. And I'll bet you they weren't singing any, uh, anything by Ariana Grande. I looked up top 10 country songs. Let's just be honest. Country is a lot more Christian than pop rock is, right? <laughs> I love this. There's one. This is so romantic. It's called tequila, and you're probably going, Pastor, you're making fun of my song. Well, listen, tequila, it's like he says, when I kiss another girl, I don't think about you. I can even go in the bar, and I don't even think about you, but when I drink tequila, baby, I think about you. Boy, that's romance right there, isn't it? I bet they weren't singing that. No, no, I thought about this. These guys have been beaten, and they're in the inner dungeon, and they're locked in clamps. I, I found, I found, I did some research, <clears throat> I found some research, and I found the song that they were singing. Here's how it went. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression. Excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and misery on me. That's what they were singing. Right there in prison. Yeah. Or, or, or here's another possibility. Here's another possibility. Maybe they were singing this. The Lord always keeps his promises He's gracious in all that he does. The Lord helps the fallen, and he lifts those who uh, falter beneath their burdens, and the eyes look to you in hope. You give them their food as they need it, and when we call upon you, your hand is there. You satisfy the hunger and the thirst of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in everything that he does. He's filled with kindness. The Lord is close to all those who call upon him. Yes, to all those who call upon him in truth. He grants the desires of those who fear him, and he hears the cries for help, and he rescues them. The Lord Lord is gracious and precious to all that love him, but he destroys the wicked. I will praise the Lord, and may everyone on this earth bless his holy name forever. I bet that's what they were singing. Psalm 145. And then, and then the rest of that verse, the author, his name is Luke, puts this little notation at the end of the verse. So they're in there, and they're singing hymns, and they're praying. And look at, look at the rest of verse 25. And the other prisoners... And the other prisoners were listening. <laughs> Why? Well, just think about this. They are prisoners too. I don't think they were getting a lot of care packages from home. I don't think there was a lot of hope in their life. They were smelling the same stench that Paul and Silas were smelling. They'd eaten the same gruel that Paul and Silas were fed. There was 
people in those cells that were without hope, just like the people who live next door to you, who are in the apartment next door to you, the one you, you hear fighting, the people that drive past your house, the one in the next cubicle, the one sitting in the cab of the truck with you, the one that's on the work site with you, people without hope, they're prisoners and they're listening to you because they know you have problems too. They know you go through trials too and they're saying, is your God still good when things are going bad? They want to know because they're looking for hope just like you and if they don't find it in a God, they'll find it somewhere else. And they are. We're all surrounded by people just like that, held in bondage to hurt and they're looking for answers. And they might be looking, they might be looking, they might be looking at you. And they want to know, is God still good? Can you honestly say that God is there when life hurts? <laughs> A man closed the jail door that day. But God was about to open it. We read about the power of Jesus and the authority of Jesus in the book of Revelation. What man shuts... <laughs> Jesus can open, and what Jesus opens, no man can shut. Verse 25, I love this. So they're singing, and they're singing songs, and suddenly, I, I can't even read this verse calmly in verse 26. I can't, I suddenly, suddenly, like, there was a massive earthquake. Can you imagine this? If this was on TV, like your whole TV's now shaking and everything's going, look, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundation, and all the doors, all the doors, not their doors, all the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. Wouldn't you love to have been in the jail that night? That would have been awesome. We had a police officer in here this morning buying coffee, and I told him, we're going to talk today about jail doors flying open. That was awesome to tell the police officers. It was great, and he says, not on my watch, too much paperwork. He said, I'm telling you, it would be great that day to be there in that place. And they're singing, and they didn't expect this to happen. They didn't anticipate this to happen. It didn't matter if it happened, because to Paul and to Silas, even when things were bad, God was still good. So they sang to him, and they gave him praise, and they gave him worship, and they prayed out loud, and God opened the doors, and everybody in that jail was freed that night. Oh, what an amazing night that was. It shook the prison to the foundation. I'm telling you, your praise, your worship shakes the prisons to the foundation, not just in your life, but to the lives of all those around you, all the doors and every chains of every prisoner. Listen, your attitude, your attitude, your worship, and your God wants everybody to know that God shows up when things are difficult in life. You know, you can grumble your way to bondage, listen, you can grumble your way to bondage, because we're good grumblers, aren't we? When one person starts to complain, I mean, just, just come on, if, if I started singing gloom, despair, and agony on me, pretty soon I could get you all to join with me. And Paul and Silas are in prison that night. We don't know what song they sang. Oh God, we believe that you're still here and that Jesus is the resurrected Savior. And we know that we have served you diligently. We're doing our best. And we know that just because we love you doesn't mean that we're going to be free of problems and trials and difficulties. Heavenly Father, we know that regardless what our circumstances are, there is an authoritative Jesus who still sits on his throne. And no matter what I feel, no matter what I see, Jesus, you still love me. You still love me. Jesus loves me, this I know. Sing it with me. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. 
And that might be the only song you can think of when the heat is on. And it does something for you. In fact, if you forget everything else I say today, let, let, let me, I'm just going to put two things on the screen for you to remember. Look at this right here. Worship connects our world to God's kingdom. And prayer connects God's power to our problems. And there might be times in your life, church, you say, my God, my God, where are you? Why have you forsaken me? But I'm going to tell you, in that moment, you're going to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But you're going to start to praise God, and when you begin to praise God, you're going to loose the chains, and you're going to open the prison doors. You're going to shake that prison right to its foundation, and he's going to set you free. I think Jesus was quoting on that day that he hung on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I think he was quoting directly from Psalm 22, but you've got to see the rest of Psalm 22. Verse number 22, I will proclaim your name to everybody, and I'm going to praise you amongst the assembled people. In other words, I'm going to let people know that even even when circumstances are bad, my God is still good. Verse number 24, he has not turned his back on them, but he's listened to their cry for help. Where is God when life hurts? He's right there, church. He inhabits, he lives in, he dwells in the praises of his people. When we start to praise God, God is right there in the midst of that praise. I don't know what kind of a prison you're in today. I don't know what kind of storm you're walking through today, but we're going to praise our way right through that storm before we walk out of that place today. 